This meeting is being recorded. It is. Yep. Being recorded. Oh, no. All right. Welcome everyone to our open mic with the Pat Conroy Literary Center. Um, tonight, our featured writer and reader is John Williams, um, who will conclude our open mic this evening. But for now, we're going to get started with our other great writers, and we have one of our regulars here who's going to start us off, Barry Dixon. And I'm going to let you take it from here. Okay, thank you very much. Brooke. You're welcome. Um, I got a little show and tell for us tonight. I was uh, doing some spring cleaning recently, and I came across some old T-shirts that I used to wear before they shrunk or shrank. <laughs> um, I found this one. I don't know if you could see it. It says, I'm silently correcting your grammar. I used to wear this just to annoy people. <laughs> and then that, a couple shelves over, I found this one. That's, that's my idea of spring cleaning, move t-shirts around different shelves. I do that every year. <laughs> it says, let's eat grandma. Let's eat grandma. <laughs> grandma. Thomas save lives. <laughs> well and, and I, I thought, and I knew I had a couple open mics coming up, so I thought this is the universe telling me what to read because it reminded me so much of a piece that's, I never know whether to read from my poetry book or, or from the manuscript of micro memoirs, but this is from the manuscript of micro memoirs, uh, which is, uh, just a collection of stories from life, little short ones, unrelated to each other. And uh, it's called Barry Who, 33 Unforgettable Micro Memoirs from Someone You Never Heard Of. It's out there wandering around different uh, publishers. I'm getting interesting responses. And they all come with a date and they're all real stories. Autumn, 2011, The Bully. Whenever I'd run into James and Emma, the junior team that worked on direct mail, I would try to give them a few respectful minutes. I confess, as agency creative director, I was more focused on glamorous TV than mail packages. One day I was in my office screening a casting tape. Suddenly a gentle knock on my door jam. James, short with long hair. Emma, tall with short hair. To me, they always looked like kids. Today, there was something extra. They looked nervous. You got a minute, asked James. Actually, I didn't. But of course, I said, sure, come on in. You got to help us, James said. It's the client. He sounded desperate. Emma's usually smiling face was today more pleading than smiling. My first thought was, oh, geez. A tough client in the ad agency business. Gee, what a surprise. This guy, Jeremy, he's rude and nasty to us like you wouldn't believe. He insults us, calls our work crap. He gets angry and throws it across conference tables. They were getting my attention. He called me at home at night twice to complain about something, Emma added. Me too, said James. I recall a distinct thought. Who is this son of a bitch? <laughs> you gotta protect us, James said. We can't take this guy anymore, please. I thought for a moment. Do you have any meetings coming up? I asked. Tomorrow morning at 8.15, James answered. 8.15, I exclaimed. Creatives in advertising weren't exactly known for their early hours. One of our favorite phrases as we wrapped up at 10 p.m. was, okay, see you tomorrow at the crack of noon. I'll be there, I said. I don't think I ever saw two young faces light up like that. It took me all of about 2.2 seconds to dislike this cocky looking 29 year old, Mr. MBA. A client has power. He can kill something you've been working on for months. It's tough to challenge them. They pay the bills. Wielding that kind of power takes a certain grace. Our Jeremy did not have it. 
I got a firsthand view of his attitude toward the young team. Me, he was a little better with, but just a little. He snapped at them and exuded condescending impatience. He was wearing on me. Mechanicals, pieces ready to go to press, were spread out on the oak conference table. And there it was, a typo. The headline read, no annual fee credit carb. If you people were more careful, there'd be less mistakes around here, he said. Finally, I couldn't resist. Don't you mean fewer mistakes? He turned just a little pink. A tiny wry smile curled in the corner of his mouth. Are you inferring I don't speak properly? He asked. No, I said. I'm implying it. You're inferring it. <laughs> James glanced at Emma, smiled, and looked down at the table. Emma, who was gay, later told me that was the closest she ever came to falling in love with a man. A few weeks later, I stopped down for a visit. They told me he was never rude again and had actually become fairly comfortable to work with. One bully down, a couple hundred million to go. Good. <laughs> well done. Thank you. We all need someone to have our back when bullies are afoot. Yeah, right. right. I, as I was rereading this, I could re-experience the pleasure in getting in his face. It was like years, 10 years ago or something. Fabulous. Brooke, am I up now? Or Barry, you've written you. another one? No, thank that's you, it Barry. Me. Okay. Well, yes. Thank you, Barry. Yes, Niles, you're next. Thank you, Barry. I enjoyed that. Thank I you. have to Vincent. I have to tell you this is the ultimate um experience and irony for me. I just got an email of three rejections while I, while I was getting ready to read this piece. But anyway, uh, I thought I would share it. It's called, it's a, it's a nonfiction piece, uh, at least I think it is, uh, titled Come For Me. It's a fairly recent piece and it's submitted, but uh, no takers yet. Come For Me. The sweat from the heat and humidity made our skin stick to the vinyl seats of the 1965 Skylark. And with windows rolled up to keep us cool, gnats blew in and collided with our eyes or tongues if our mouths were open. On the 30 minute drive to our grandmother's clapboard house off the ground and resting on old brick pylons every Sunday after, Sunday after church, we often nap being lullabied to sleep by the rhythmic ticking of the skylark like a sewing machine and then waking up with seat creases on our cheeks that grandmother kissed when she hugged us and offered us pound cake and sweet tea. We swung in the wooden swing creaking back and forth or rocked in paint peeling chairs while she and my, grand she and my parents talked of weather, war, politics, Jesus, or relatives. Sometimes we shelled peas, snapped green beans for her in metal bowls or shut corn, and she canned and, or froze our labors for reunions or funerals where people would bless her and compliment her. We hated going every week and whined, but our mother said, we come for her because she'd come for you. We would much prefer our friends trampoline across the street the coolness of the community pool or riding bicycles on railroad tracks until the whistle blasted us and warned us off. But our, at our grandmother's, we explored the shed out back with antique green glass bottles and jars or searched for treasure while crawling under the house on the cold dirt, avoiding elaborate spider webs, big cockroaches, or even an occasional rat snake. When it was time to leave before dark, our mother's hands would dust us off, tell us we were filthy and that she might not, be, not, might not be able to get the stains out of our clothes. When we were home, she directed us to take a bath in the claw feet tub with soap our grandmother had made and gifted us at Christmas 
a gift that disappointed us, even though our parents had told us in advance to be appreciative, say thank you because we didn't want to hurt her feelings. She didn't have money for dolls, trains, or sports equipment. When her heart sputtered and stopped in her chest, she simply left us one hot and humid summer day, like that scholar that stopped running after 15 years. Now, over 50 years later, I long for those sticky seats on Sunday and visits at my grandmother's house. With her genetic makeup and my own heart skipping beats, I'm hopeful that she will come for me and we can rock on a porch and talk about weather, war, politics, Jesus, and relatives. That's it. Thank y'all. Could we'll be in there. What did you say? Uh, that I said you could you could feel being there. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's, I'm sorry whoever <laughs> sent you those rejection slips didn't recognize the the wonderful way you take the mundane stuff and make it fascinating. Oh, great imagery! I enjoyed the imagery in that piece. <laughs> yeah, homemade soap. The kids not appreciating. Yeah, you know, it's also yeah. some real life, and it's oh, very, it's intriguing, but. You tell those people that I said. <laughs> yeah, well, the, re the rejections, the rejections weren't from for this particular piece. Oh, they were from oh, other pieces. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Which aren't nearly as good as this piece, but that's uh, it. This piece is one of your best, Niles, and you, Thank you. some great stuff. Wow. That's that's great. Good. Thank you, Niles. We haven't heard you read in so long. No, it's, it's been a while. Good to be back. Thanks it's been a while. Back. Good to be back with y'all. Yeah, thank you. All right, Jane. What you yeah, got for us? Always put me behind the worst people. Uh, it's either Barry or it's Niles. Thanks a lot, Brett. <laughs> I'll put you behind both this time. <laughs> yeah, I know. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so. Okay, no. well, I'm reading again from my uh, Boston novel, the latest chapter. Um, the Boston novel is called um, To the Next Home Run. And um, if you, just to give you a little background, remind you of where we were, uh, Jimmy and Ange, the couple, um, one of the main couple, main uh, characters in the novel, um, Jimmy's from Charleston, Charlestown. Uh, the, I, he's the Irish kid married to Angela who came from the North End and she's Italian. And they've been fighting with their parents <clears throat> for years over where the baby that they've just had is going to be baptized. And the Italian family won out. It's going to be over at Sacred Heart in the North End. Um, a warning first before I read this, this is not about politically correct people. It's 1967, um, Da and Ma, who are the, um, the couple in uh, Jimmy's parents from Charlestown are crude throwbacks to a less sensitive time in our periods, in our world. And herein lies the irony of the whole story, um, which when the, when the book concludes, you'll understand why I had to say some of the things that I did, okay. So we're going to start, they're in the car. Um, Dara and Mara have just picked up Jimmy and, and, and Angela and the baby, and they're headed over to the North End for the baptism. <clears throat> Jeez, and all the saints in heaven, Jimmy, his mother called out. Get in the car, we're late already. What is that gown thing on the boy? Couldn't you find him a little white suit or something? Though it was a short ride over the bridge and down to North Square, Jimmy knew it would seem like forever. There was no doubt that Angela's mood would be sour by the time they reached the church. But she had herself had said they weren't taking the kid on the tee on a Sunday, not a kid in a white gown. It's traditional, Ma, Ange answered for her husband. She had already decided to maintain peace, no matter what was said. My sister and her husband are godparents, and it's their job to buy the baby the baptismal gown. 
It signifies purity. Mama wouldn't be happy if he showed up in anything else. Jimmy's ma sniffed and stared straight ahead as they headed for the bridge over the inner harbor. She began to hum. It's a long way from Tipperary, faintly, but with purpose. Jimmy recognized the tune after the, a few bars. Ma, knock it off, please. Ange tightened her hold on Tony and smoothed his dark curls. Jimmy knew Ange was aware the kid needed a trip to the barber, but still could not bring herself to part with the hair on his head. She'd said his babyhood would be over soon enough. Jimmy knew exactly what would come next. His father rarely disappointed. Dow rotated his head a quarter turn, keeping an eye on the road and blurted, he looks like a faggot in that gown and long hair. My grandson, the fairy, he ought to be baptized Antoinette instead of Anthony. Jimmy's mother whacked Dar on the arm saying, Dennis Sr., not on a Sunday for heaven's sake. She was too late. Angela screeched, stop the car. Stop this goddamn car right now and let me out. Jimmy, make your father stop this minute. Her voice frightened Tony and he began to wail. The sounds of racking sobs Sucking intakes of air, followed by more intense sobs, filled the car. Da yelled, shut that crying up. I can't stand the noise. How am I supposed to drive a car listening to that? Jimmy knew things had reached a dangerous point. He encircled her and Tony in his arms, whispering in her ear, just calm down, Ange, just a mile or two more. He continued to repeat calming words in her ear while stroking the baby's face and wiping away his tears. He had to remind himself that it was just another mile or two. God damn it, he thought. We shouldn't have taken, we should have taken the tea over. The freaking rattler would have been better than this shit show. Now I understand why my brother and his wife said they'd see us over there. Angela and the baby gradually quieted. The baby's cries reduced to hiccups until Dow wound up and sent his final shot over the front seat. Couldn't have found anyone on the Rourke side for godparents? Well, here's what I gotta say. If the priest don't announce his full baptized name as Anthony Dennis Rourke at the end, when he holds the baby up, I'm gonna raise such a stink, they'll hear it in Quincy. Jimmy watched his wife's mouth go rigid, jaw muscles tight. Her deep set eyes took on a steely cast and a flush blossomed under her olive skin. He'd seen the transformation before and sensed his lovely wife had the capacity for murder in her soul. And all for a name, a name that she had kept secret from everyone as far as he knew. He peered at her again. Today's not gonna be the day she goes homicidal, he decided. Not with Tony in her arms and a family party ahead. He took a risk and laughed, tossed the insult back at Da. Ah, you old bullshitter, you don't want anything named after you that has a dress on. Down low and out of the rear view mirror sight, Jimmy pumped his fist at Angela. Her jaw relaxed. Da pretended to concentrate on diving, driving. Ma made a show of being fascinated by the seagulls overhead. I don't think we'll leave it there for now. A lot more to this scene, but yeah, thanks. Awesome. Well, it was a great awkward. image to end on, Jane. <laughs> I like how you just decided, and I'm just going to end there. Well, you know, that's a tense enough scene. It gets worse, but. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You got to do something with this novel. Uh, intending on it. Yeah. 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 Intending on it. Um, the whole point of the novel is about um discrimination against every different kind of group that isn't your kind of group and um there'll be some comeuppances that happen as the story progresses and and, and ends anyway yeah good very strong the dialogue is very strong yeah i love the dialogue love having it's a lot of fun to write yeah. all right well um our next three we have I'm going to do Barb. You're next. You're ready. Sure. And then Denise, 
and Mary. So um, I know we just had Diane join us. I don't know if, are you gonna read or? No. Okay, all right. So Diane and Anne are gonna be listening, which is fine. And so yeah, Barb, if you wanna start. Okay. Um, tell us what you're reading. This is a flash fiction piece called Opportunity Knocks. After licking his lips and shaking his hair in the rearview mirror one last time, he smoothly walked from the parking lot to the gym, letting his shiny gold bends fend for itself. His biggest personal decision each day was wardrobe color. Today, he chose black and purple, looking a little like a tall prince, the singer, not the son of a monarch. Before signing with Nike, he had a monochromatic walking billboard for them. Now he was, now that he was under contract, he became Technicolor. Maybe that's why he always ran late. Too many choices. I watched him from the entrance of the university gym, lifting his chin from his chest and looking out his periphery, he expected a swarm of admirers. There were none. I glanced inconspicuously at my watch. 30 minutes beyond our scheduled appointment, and this is the third and last reschedule. Two Nike photographers orchestrated separate shoots earlier in the month for him to no avail. They called me as a last resort, knowing my past relationship with him. Camera equipment had been set for over an hour. College guys in the weight room gladly posed so I could get the lighting correct the warm glow soaking into their skin instead of bouncing off the walls. Nike would be pleased to have these shots, if only they featured his mug in some way. Hey, Al, everything's set up. I just need for you to jump in the shoes, grab a ball, and take a few directions. Then entertain me with some of your own poses. 20 minutes tops, I said, as he walked into the building. Seeing his large golden brown eyes for the first time or his skill to spot his target in traffic down court, you know how he got his nickname. Looking down, he chose to walk right by me without eye contact or acknowledgement of any kind. Flabbergasted, I smirked and carried on. I knew him well, knew many of his moves on and off the court. As a student athlete myself, majoring in photography, we spent much of our time in college together. He promised me studio time back then, but never came through. I didn't push it. He did get me covered the photo access to the Summer Olympics when he made the team. Nike featured him and several of his Olympic gold teammates in an ad campaign that carried into his rookie year. In his second year, he started to believe that he was all they said and more, and he began wavering in his commitments. This was his last chance to show up and be a professional or end up endorsing kangaroos, the shoe from down under. Three university football linemen were walking towards us, watching the exchange of body language. Hey, you don't have to walk behind him, you know, one yelled out. I don't walk behind him, I walk all over him, I said nonchalantly. Tackles bellowed in the air behind me as the mass of men fell out laughing and grabbed at each other, not wanting to fall. He continued straight down the hall. I turned right and headed up the stair to my mobile portrait room. As I entered, I looked at the shoe sizes on the orange boxes. 12, 14, 10. I headed to the weight room. Anyone here wear a size 12, 14, or 10 and want to be in a Nike ad? Seven guys all dropped their weights and ran to the door. Before the clanging of metal stopped, I had my replacements. Line drop. After testing my lighting in the rafters, I sat courtside at the fabulous forum, taking it all in. I visualized where I'd be later that evening, shooting what realistically could be Michael Jordan's first championship. I pulled the tattered magazine from my equipment bag and opened it to page four. It was the first time Nike used no names to sell basketball shoes, and it was the hottest ad two years running. On page five, I had taped a promotional ad at the Nike photographers that the Nike photographer sent me of Owl, no longer wearing Nikes. After being drafted by the 76ers and becoming a journeyman in the NBA, he signed again as the Sixer, the Adelaide 36ers of South Australia. 
instead of Nike, he managed to contract with kangaroos, the original shoe with pockets. He stood in his uniform, holding a basketball on Kangaroo Island off the coast of Adelaide, also known as Carta Patinga, and literally translated as Island of the Dead. I wondered if the irony was lost on him. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Really good circular. That's that was wonderful. That was good. Did you want Thank to know you. who it was? Uh, no names. His no name's names. Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Nicknames only. <laughs> we haven't heard you read in a while either, Barb. No. Yeah. That was, yeah. That was... Welcome back. Fun, Good. To, fun to be back. Good entry to come back. Thank you. All right. I think, yeah, Denise and then Mary. Sure. Thank you. I have a poem that I'm not sure I've read in public before, so y'all may be guinea pigs. This is called, But Words Will Never Hurt Me. But words will never hurt me. Oh, but they do. From father who required A's. Disappointment over A minuses broke girl child and loud scolding over B's terrified her. But his angry words, when losing trivial pursuit to girl child grown, were, you're smarter than a woman has a right to be. The irony and misogyny trod on her very soul. From employer who held in her hand the other's career, where approachability and communication were everything the painful judgment was intimidating and pedantic. And the other's self-esteem forever wore that scorched brand on her heart. From husband who expected wife to cook and bake, sew and clean, earn a wage and tutor the children, but one day he spit, you'd make someone a really good grandma as he cast her aside for younger wife, bereft of those skills. Wife's aching back stiffened in preparation for carrying life thereafter by herself. However, it is in finding and blending words of one's choosing that the salve for the hurt parts is brewed. Words hurt, but motivate words hurt but strengthen, words fuel wisdom and power redemption. Powerful, <laughs> powerful. Great. Great pictures. Great, yep. Nice. Like that. That was a that was a great reading. Thank you, Denise. It was. Thanks. Yeah. And now, is it my turn? <laughs> yeah, it is. All right. This is my first time in a long time here. I came last fall, but I haven't been active because I've been busy teaching school. But my goal is to transition into writing. Um, recently, I attended. Um, the Clarksville Writers Masterclass with Brian, And so I really enjoyed it. And she really encouraged me to keep trying my craft. And so I'm working on this novel and I thought I would read it to you guys to see what you think. Of course, my name is Mary Spearman. And the synopsis is, this is a story about a mother and a daughter discovering the past while moving into the future of uncertainty together. Catherine is the daughter and she learns that often things are not what they seem to be. And Vivian, her mother, takes us on a journey of love and hardship. The story is set in South Carolina 
on Hilton Head and in the Lake region of South Carolina, up around Kiwi and east of Toei. Bad marriages and lying spouses who break laws, leaving behind strong women who don't give up. The novel intertwines history, real estate development, and relationships to create a backdrop that is relatable to the changing South. So, so far I've got around 60,000 words and it's like, I don't know what to do with it at this point. I do wanna see, get feedback and see what you think as a group, if it's, cause you are from the low country and you have a different perspective. I'm from the up country. Um, although I've visited all areas of the state. This is the first chapter and um, I wanted to get your feedback on it. Chapter one, and I, I'm writing it from the perspective of alternating. Chapter one is Catherine, the daughter. Chapter two is Vivian, the mother. Uh, so it alternates characters. Sometimes I feel like a fiddler crab working, and this is Catherine. Sometimes I feel like a fiddler crab working my way through. I'm so sorry. Mommy is so sorry. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Thumbs up if you can hear me. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes I feel like a fiddler crab, working my way through the mud and muck just to get swept away by a tide of unrelenting horse. The love of the low country, it speaks to my soul, and I often find myself alone marveling at the natural surroundings. Nature is the best part of Golden Harbor, the development where we live. Golden Harbor was a pristine development that sprang from the pluff mud and marsh grass in the 1970s. A prime development and only those with money and status live in such a place. The development consisted of tennis courts, swimming pools, and nationally televised tournaments. Most millionaires of the Southeast own homes and vacationed here. My husband, my husband was hired to help plan and execute new developments on the island. So we moved from Atlanta to Hilton Head in search of success. I don't remember when I began to feel like I did not fit into this life in this place of grand homes and paradise-like developments. Maybe it was the time I walked in the Cafe Louise with the marinara at the marina and realized I had never eaten in a restaurant that grand. A person played a piano, linen tablecloths adorned the tables, and a formal place settings of glass of dishes and glasses and her butter was placed at every chair. I was about to eat dinner with the president of Golden Harbor Development and his lovely wife. I felt like I was going to be sick or that I was not really supposed to be there. Or possibly it was the time I realized I ordered crab legs at the Junior League of Hilton Head's annual fall luncheon and I had no idea how to eat them or that I shouldn't have ordered them to start with because I was going to dribble salty butter down the front of my carefully selected silk tank and look like a fool for the rest of the lunch. Neither of those incidents really hit home and let me know that I was somehow different from the people around me until I overheard a conversation between two of the wives from the company my husband had just joined, talking about how they enrolled their children in boarding school or hired nannies as soon as they could so that they would have their me time. That was the moment when something internally told me I was different and what matters to me is different from what matters to the others. I just smiled and agreed knowing that my values were inherently different from those I found myself in the company of. If I were to have children, which like my mama, unlike the ladies of the development and clubs, I would not seek out the help of nannies or send them off to school. I'd always wanted kids, but Will didn't see the need to rush it. He was so busy climbing the corporate ladder. When we finally decided to try, I guess it was too late. I just never got pregnant. Now I'm 42, so time is of the essence. Will still does not see the need to rush it. It is as if he wants to me by his side to play the role for him, but not to build a life with me. 
The longer we're married, the more I realize that we are living his dream, but not mine. My husband, Will, and I have been living in Golden Harbor on Hilton Head for 20 years now. And I almost daily, I find myself amazed at how shallow and silly some who are connected to the development have become. Tonight, I have my orders to go purchase a new dress and be at the country club no later at 730 to meet with investors who will be funding and giving input on a new development in the up country. I know my role. I'm to smile and make a good impression and tell them how wonderful it has been to live in this gated community all these years, away from the horrors of the real world. We don't have to leave the development for anything. We have our own grocery store, bank, and plenty of places to do hair and offer spa treatments and cater to our every need. After all, it is much safer that way. Everyone who comes to Golden Harbor passes through the guard gate and must have a stated purpose. Low-level crimes in our development are basically non-existent, legalized plunder by high-ranking lawyers, real estate developers, and connected businessmen and crimes are expected and often the talk of the club. And that's the first part of chapter one. And I've written about, I guess, 50,000 words already of this novel. And it goes on, um, the developer has got his stake in land in this region, which is the mountains. And he's trying to take it over and make it into more of a gated community as well, which this person is against it. Um, come to find out her mother owns land that she didn't know she had up here. And there is a little bit of a murder mystery involved too. So it's kind of interspersed with real estate development and how you should preserve land, how you should um, develop communities and things of that nature. But it's at the heart of it is a love story and a relationship story between the mother and the daughter. So if you want to share your thoughts. <laughs> My, my first thought is that as a reader, or actually a listener in this case, there's a tremendous amount of potential there to explore, like the feelings of not fitting in and mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the social class conflict and the, uh, uh, the tension, et cetera, between, I mean, I hope it goes on to explore some of that. And that does that play a role in, in all the stuff that happens? It does. Um infidelity it draws me in is what yeah I'm yeah and that was that being the first chat dress what i'm trying to hook the reader um i'm also trying to teach a little bit about how south carolina has developed in that my grandparents lost their land on lake Huey to deep power and so it's a little bit of that background's in there about how once the once the power company bought the land, eventually it wound up in the hands of developers. And the people that are from the surrounding areas, whether it's Hilton Head or whether it's Beaufort or Pickens County, we're all getting kind of pushed aside. I guess you would call it gentrification if you were downtown Greenville through high dollar cost, you know. And so it kind of deals with that a little bit, but then that's this love story intertwined in it hopefully to hook people. Um, eventually, what winds up happening is she finds out she never knew her father. Catherine never knows her father at the beginning of the story. And she finds out that when her mother married her father as a young woman, that she was actually um, marrying a murderer. Her, her dad was a murderer. Oh, and her mother didn't know that when she married him. And he wound up on the 10 most wanted list back in the 50s. And that's why her mother took her to Atlanta and raised her down there. And so her mother raises her in Atlanta and she winds up marrying this developer from Hilton Head. And that's how she winds up at Hilton Head. So there's some backstory in there that you'll find out during the novel, but it's kind of, it's the saga, I guess you'd say. I don't know, but it's been in my head for years and I've been trying to write it down. So this is just the beginning, but um, that's just where I'm at at this point. There, there is a lot in there though. I hope it doesn't come across too 
judgmental, but at the same time, some of it, I guess, is about how I feel about um, gated communities, for instance. I mean, for instance, having spent time here, there, and yonder, I'm not real fond of them, but um, I understand why they're there, you know, but it, at the same time, it's something that growing up on a farm, the only gates we knew were cow gates, so it's, it's just a different type of um, belief, I guess, belief is I say keep going and take it where it goes and keep coming back and reading it. Uh, yeah. I enjoy, I enjoyed it and I love your accent. Well, I can't run away from that. And I, I apologize for looking so bad and sounding so bad. I have COVID. So it's like I'm sitting out on the porch oh, no. breathe a little bit tonight, but it's, it's bad this time. And I had it in 20 and it wasn't that bad. I don't remember it in December of 20, but then it came back and, my mom's had it this week, and a lot of people up here have had it this week, so it's rampant right now. Did you say that you took a workshop with Bren McLean? I sure did, and I oh, love it. Lucky and you. Oh, that's her wonderful. Her book, One Good Mama Bone, has been one of my that's favorite a great book. books. Great um, book. And even in this novel, it's like I told her, I said, I don't know where it's going to take me, and I got back and I read 10,000 words since the workshop in May. And it and it I haven't wrote that much in a while, but I'm up to around sixty thousand. And I couldn't believe it when the novel took me to, to Dabuski, which is where Pat's Water is Wide was written. And I was like, do I take it there? And I'm like, well why the heck not? Because I love Dabuski and I love to go there. And so I took it there. But it's like Brian has taught me so much about if you don't like things you can fix it fiction is where you can fix it and it's like that just sticks with me and yeah. so her her work I have really loved one um, thing I, I love about Bren's writing is that she takes you into a scene um, as few people have as few people will and she yeah. doesn't preach she takes you into a scene with the dialogue and the the characters personalities Yes, she, uh, she could set up a scene like very few people can and just pull your heart out through your chest. Uh, it's so, so real. My mother being a cattle lady for all her life, yeah. raising cattle. When I tried to get mama to listen to that book because her main character in that book could have been my mama. And so when I played it for mama, she couldn't get past the first chapter. It was just too hard. It was just too hard to listen to that. That's um, a good sign. Yeah. But my yeah. point, my point, Mary, was um, take your take your reader into a scene with dialogue and more dialogue. character development, much more dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they always say, show, don't tell. So yeah. much, and much, I'm still telling. <laughs> yeah, much less telling, much more showing by setting yeah. up the scenes. And yeah. I, think, I think it would come alive because you've got a very, very meaty subject there and a great book. That, that's the subject of a great book. You've got a lot of meat there. Yeah. Yeah. But um, don't jam it down people's throat. Play, play your hand lightly and give it some good dialogue and some good scenes. Good and, advice. Yeah, I, th I think it is. It was given to me a long time ago and been good advice. Yeah. Congratulations. So you're Thank you. Good yeah. I also write some children's things that I have gotten feedback from my students on and a little bit of poetry. I just, I like to write. So that's, I do a, a variety of things. Well, we write because we can't not write, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Most definitely. Uh, Thank you, Mary, for sharing. No problem. Enjoyed it. Feel better. If you feel better, too. Um, yeah. We're going to um, introduce our featured uh, writer tonight, um, John, if he's ready. I'm ready. There we go. We can hear you. Just making sure. <laughs> uh, okay, good. Um, so yeah, our uh, featured writer, John G. Williams, uh, he is from Yemassee, South Carolina, a small town along the South Carolina coast. 
At 17, anxious for travel and bored by school and small town life, John enlisted in the Marines. Four years later, after completing tours in Europe, the Caribbean and Southeast Asia, he returned to South Carolina where he attended the Citadel and graduated from Charleston Southern University. Now retired, John has worked as a teacher, stockbroker, and realtor. He also served 26 years in the South Carolina Army National Guard. John now lives in Beaufort, South Carolina with his wife, Marion, and he is currently working on <laughs> his, uh, his uh, new novel um, called okay. currently Pocatelago Point, or Pocatelago Point. Very good. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so help me welcome everyone, John Williams. What? I was Copy so afraid idea. I was going to mess up that title, and I still feel like I did, but I got you were, there. You were, you were, you, you, your second attempt was right on. Uh, it's, it's, you just have to remember it's near Kusihachi, and uh, it, Pocatalago pops right back in there. Yeah, uh, talk, I heard a couple of y'all saying you hated to follow some people, but I've I've learned some stuff tonight, and I've heard some some real nice stories. So uh, it's it's certainly been an entertaining evening. Um, I just published a novel called Too High in the Wind. It's a mystery with the, or suspense, more correctly than a mystery, with a strong romantic subplot. It's, it starts on, which I'm going to read from, from on Eastern Long Island, and it ends up, both these people end up as the protagonist and the co-protagonist, male and female, end up as teachers on St. Helena Island. Um, so it's, anybody from around here, I think, would find it interesting. I, I put maps, I, I modified some maps and made it come out to match the story, but it's, uh, We'll start out, and I've never read this before out loud, I don't think it's with chapter one. Um, and I guess this is probably since it's published the, the last time I'll, <laughs> I'll ever read uh, from this, from this group. But anyway, where we will start, we've, we've got this woman named Sally. She's a formal Navy SEAL, and she's launching in a dinghy and she's on her way to intercept uh, another lady, lady who she's having an affair with her husband. And uh, she's, her plans are to kill her. So we'll start with Sally in the boat. And I can't, the first word I can't pronounce, it means an island surrounded by islands. And it's, it's an American uh, Indian um, name, but I'll give you, it a you shot. Want to, you want me to try to say it? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, can you, no. can you see it? No, okay. All right. This is from this is from Too High in the Wind. Manhansack at a Kawas Awamak. Sally Jordan mumbled to herself, looking back at Shelter Island's receding shoreline, an island sheltered by island. Images of the Native Americans who who named it floated from the darkness. She could picture them sliding through the water, decked out in war paint, paddling their canoes across Shelter Island Sound to protect what was theirs. She felt connected. She was a warrior too in part Cherokee. It wasn't personal. You had to protect what was yours. By the time the Manhattans learned this, the Dutch owned Manhattan. Now part of Manhattan was hers, conquered by guts and guile, and she wasn't going to trade it for some trinkets offered by one of the original settlers. She'd skipped the war paint. Being discovered alone in Michael's dinghy in the middle of the sound could be explained. Add camo paint and the explanation became a bit more difficult. She wore black tights with a matching turtleneck and a black watch cap covered her head. If she needed more camouflage, then her mission had failed. She'd first seen Shelter Island from the air stuffed into a tiny Cessna 150 piloted by Michael's son, Brad. Brad. Brad flew them in across Long Island's North Fork, circling Shelter Island as he pointed out the family's compound perched along Daring Harbor's rocky shore. 
Their South Forest exit proved exciting when Brad dropped the Cessna down to eyeball level and scattered the rich and famous that lounged along the Hamptons purified beaches. She smiled at the scene, but two years later, she could still picture the layout. It would help her tonight. Michael's dinghy consisted solely to shuttle him between his dock and his sailboat, not to cross the open water like Noyak Bay. Underpowered and unstable, it wallowed in the swells, struggling to make headway against the currents that rushed around the island. At least the motor was quiet. Michael had explained the first time he took her sailing. It was a four-stroke like a car's, not a two-stroke like most small outboards. He'd said a lot more, but she hadn't listened, mansplaining. The important thing was that it was quiet. She'd sailed in the bay before with Michael and his bitch wife, Allison, but never at night and never alone. As a child, she'd hated the darkness. She blamed her grandmother, though she'd begged to hear the stories of strange happenings along the West Virginia hollows. Mine collapses in steep mountain roads provided Granny Jordan with a never ending supply of victims and her vivid imagination did the rest. At night, things always looked different. Her mind played tricks with her eyes, convincing her her worst fear was hidden in the nearest shadow, patiently waiting. Her year in Afghanistan was a game changer. We own the night was her team's motto, and they taught her to appreciate the darkness, to wrap herself in its protective cloak and become someone else's worst fear. She'd do that tonight. Allison was about to learn a deadly lesson. Sweat trickled down Sally's face, burning her eyes, forming a salty crust on her mouth. She licked her lips and wiped her forehead with her sleeve. It was hot for April. Even the eternal sea breezes felt warm. The tights and turtlenecks were a little much, but they were for concealment, not comfort. Beauty and stealth know no pain, she thought, trying to smile at her cleverness. Getting ready mentally, psyching herself, believing she could do it. That was the hard part. Killing Allison would not be easy, especially with a knife. Guns were different. At least you had some distance. She didn't done that herself, or at least she might have. Noise, smoke, and general chaos made it hard to tell. A fog of war, up close and personal. Afghanistan was two mm -hmm. years ago. She'd spent a year there, a woman doing a man's job, an Air Force forward controller. The SEALs and Rangers had another name for her, Death Angel. It was an awesome power. Sometimes she felt like God, raining death and destruction from above with a few cryptic words whispered softly into a radio mic. It was a time to kill. The time to heal would come later, or maybe not at all. It was a sanitized way to wage war. The enemy died silently on a distant ridgeline consumed in an orange and black ball while she returned to the safety and comfort of her forward operating base. One wish, but one mission was different. That night, the enemy was where they landed, waiting, hidden in the lake. Their closeness protected them from the planes that circled above. Here she fought, reacting, not thinking, like she was an actress playing a role. Even the enemy seemed unreal. She'd expected to face fear-spirited warriors with sun-hardened skin. Instead, she battled green video game figures that glowed in her nice vision goggles, scurrying across the rocks to escape her fire. But Afghanistan wasn't Long Island. It was someone else's world where she was a temporary inhabitant, a strange and exotic place where rules changed, their circumstances dictated, drug lords were certainly, suddenly allies and enemies became friends. She'd adapted, surprised at her moral agility, but not changed. Now she was forced to adapt again. Maybe she had changed. She checked her wa watch and released the throttle. She'd used the flicker and lights along both shorelines to keep, to keep her mid-channel and the aura of the lights at Sag Harbor Marina to guide her south. Now her final leg would take her west. She'd been on the water for about 20 minutes. Her right hand felt numb from the motor's vibration and her back hurt from the back of the seat. Shaking her hand to revive it, she removed a pair of binoculars from her mission bag and studied Long Island shoreline. She didn't see much. A thin mist coated the island, blurring its feature and reflecting the moonlight. She lowered the binoculars and slumped down in the seat. 
maybe the fog would clear. If it didn't, she'd go further north, cross, cross the bay and head back up the island. Either way, she'd interrupt, she'd intercept Allison and complete her mission. Sally liked the term mission. It had a nice sound, legal and official. Murder was such a harsh word. A rhythmic beat from the West interrupted her thoughts. Turning toward the noise, she spotted the green and red lights of South Ferry at Mid Channel heading toward Long Island's South Shore. The Hamptons crowds had launched into the lands of the $20 martini. It was time to go. She swung the boat right, setting her course north for the ferry's route, gliding away from its lights and into the darkness. Her head, Long Island, began to reveal its shape, changing from a vague outline to a series of curves and inlets. She swung the dinghy north, parallel in the shore, shore, then released the throttle, drifting with the current. The fog lifted slowly, clearing the land but shrouding the trees with its gray droplets. She used a tiny pin light, pin light to light the chart. Orienting the chart to the land was a secret. Once they matched, the mystery was solved. Sally started by identifying the point that jutted out like a waving finger separating Noyak from Little Peconic Bay. That done, it was simply a matter of tracing the shoreline south until she found what she was looking for. A narrow inlet where the waters penetrated inland, stopping just short of Noyak Road's sandy shoulders. She'd been there this morning, picking up scallop shells and studying the terrain. Site reconnaissance, the rangers call it, much better than map reconnaissance. No surprises that way. Surprises could get you killed. Sally opened the throttle and angled towards her objective. A hundred yards offshore, she killed the engine and tossed the anchor overboard. Short oaks lined the inlet drawing, drawing shadows along its banks. The inlet appeared empty, but she waited, watching and listening. Patience was a virtue. An olive green ammo can lay at her feet. Sally leaned, leaned leaned down and opened it. She flinched at its metallic pop. A jungle knife lay on top. It seemed to stare at her, its shiny surface reflected in the moonlight. She picked the knife up and drew its blade slightly across her, her thumb, lightly across her thumb. Its sharpness tugged at her skin. She'd killed a deer with it this morning. The image haunted her. She loved animals more than people. And the people she'd killed deserved to die. The deer was innocent. Allison was guilty. Now Allison's image replaced the deer's. Sally could see the knife slice across Allison's long pale neck, red, bright red blood spurting from the wound. Allison would try to scream, but she'd choke on her blood. Sally could hear the gurgling. Trembling, she let the knife slide back. Trembling, she let the, slide, but sl the knife slide back into the can. Was she really gonna do this? Spasms racked her stomach. She slammed the box closed, stuck her head over the sides and vomited. Sally's image was gone. Allison's image was gone. <laughs> Sally dipped her hands into the dark water and splashed her face and rinsed her mouth, spitting the salty water, salty water back into the bay. She studied the shoreline. The purging had cleared her thoughts. The anchor was holding and she was in the right place. She sat down on the rubber tubing, chin in hand, and pulled out her dog tags. She fondled them like a rosary, a ritual she'd performed before and after each mission, fingering her religion and blood type as the metal tag slid through her fingers. So far, so good. No need to change for what she hoped was her last mission. She stuffed the dog tags inside her shirt and looked at her watch. Its Iron Man, its Iron Man logo stared back at her, mocking the sudden weakness that traveled down her arms and into her hands. She had to move. Allison would be here soon and she had things to do. Everything would be in place. Once she was ready, she could still back out. No one would know. She'd heard Michael answer the phone in the kitchen. She'd listened then retreated. From the conversation, she knew it was Allison. See you at 11, honey, and be careful on Noyak, he said. I'm eating supper at the club. This meant Allison would pass her by about 10.30. She knew people on the islands were always in exact with their time. The ferry waited for no one. She lifted the anchor, curling the ropes as she pulled, a habit she'd picked up from Michael. Neatness counted on boats regardless of size. She stowed the rope in the bow and began to paddle. A light breeze 
combined with an outgoing tide pushed back, holding the boat in an invisible web. She was losing ground. Reluctantly, she lowered the paddle and reached for the starter rope. So much for stealth. Her first pearl produced only noise and smoke. Crank, you sorry SOB, she muttered to the little Honda. Sally braced herself firmly against the wooden stern and tried again. The motor sputtered, teasing her before returning to its normal muted growl. She slipped in the gear and headed into the inlet. This short of the beach, she cut the, the engine, tilting the motor up as the dinghy snuggled into the soft sand. Sally sat still listening, but all she heard were small waves collapsing against the beach. She was alone. I, I think that's about it on my, on my time. Right, bro? <laughs> I wasn't paying attention to it, Tom. But <laughs> Say what? I said I wasn't paying attention to the time. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I feel flattered by that. Yeah. Um, but it's, this is available for sale. At places where you, you hold, can buy. Can you hold it up so we can see the cover? Too high in the wind. Can everyone see that? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the... Does anyone have any questions for John? I have a comment. I loved when you said that um, she was surprised at her moral agility. Mm -hmm. And then shortly thereafter, there was that great line about she was fingering her dog tags yes. as if they were rosaries. Yeah, so uh, she's, you made a very, very interesting character there. And Thank boy, you. that Thank action moved right along. You, we were just hanging on every word. Well, thank you so much, Jane. That's good. Uh, That's the good. dog tags actually come to life at the last few pages of the novel. They play a, an ah. unexpected point. Uh, if I'm not giving away too much. Don't give the ending yeah. away. Yeah, no. Okay. It's, um, anyway. Wonderful well, thank you. Book. Yeah, wonderful book. Available in all fine bookstores? Available at all fine bookstores. Amazon keeps uh, saying it's out of stock, low stock, then, then it gets them, then it, uh, <laughs> they're, I think they're, they're messing with me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Probably has more to do with Ingram, Ingram than, uh, and paper supplies. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 the paper supply has been a problem, which, which, yeah. Was, yeah was not good. <laughs> not good at all. Nope. Well, very, thank you so very, much, John, yeah, for exciting. being our featured writer this evening. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Like I say, I've, in, I've enjoyed it, and I've, uh, I've learned a couple of things, and, you know, it's, uh, you always, you have to always steal ideas, so uh, <laughs> I'm always on the lookout. But the next <laughs> one will be set, Pocatalago Point, will be set more, I, as it says in my biography, I'm from Yemisee, uh, and um, it will be very, very Southern in its orientation and uh, its characters as they age and mature. Is Pocatelico Point, did I say that right? Is that a real place? Pocatelico is a, is a real place. It would be near Point South, uh, years and years ago, there used to be a big, tr there's nothing at that intersection now, but the Pocatalago River's there. It, it's only, it's, it's not much wider than a creek, but, uh, you know, it used to be a big truck stop there uh, many years ago, uh, but with I-95 to moved everything away. So uh, those, those developers will get you. <laughs> <laughs> Very right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, John. And thank you uh, to everyone here who read tonight and listened. Um, we'll be back for open mic July 14th. Brooke, um, are you not ready? No, I am not. Okay. <laughs> Maybe next time. <laughs> <laughs> We miss her voice. Oh, thank you. Maybe next time. Maybe next time. All right. But, um, I hope to see you all here next next month, July fourteenth. 
thank you again, John, and um, hope to see you all next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, all. Good night. Good night.